What is happening? So just got home from the Sento, which is the Japanese bathhouse. And it's different from the onsen, whereas the onsen is natural hot springs, pretty famous, um, found all over Japan, some are outdoors, very beautiful. The Sento is more of a Japanese staple of everyday life. It's I live across the street from one and it literally looks like it's in the basement of an apartment building because it kind of is. But it's, you know, think about like tiles and maybe you've seen one with like the Mount Fuji mural on the wall and there's sauna, there's a cold plunge, there's several jacuzzis with jets, showers. It's like a, um, a spa, but, you know, kind of gritty and ancient and just part of Japanese culture. I'm going to try to piece together several different ideas surrounding one common theme that just hit me hard in the last hour, but it's something that I've been thinking about the last few days and really just comes from this last month and the spiritual odyssey that I've been on really plunging into the depths of myself and feeling like I'm crossing a threshold in my life from the person I was kind of clinging to my old ways and nothing wrong with that. I don't blame myself because I just didn't know what was happening, but and that's all kind of vague, but I kind of hit rock bottom and realized that the pain, physical pain that I'm feeling in my body, I've had chronic back pain for six years, realized through the guidance of somebody else that it's actually emotional pain that I'm dealing with. And it's caused me to really completely change my life and start looking at childhood traumas and with the help of, the, of a therapist, really just going through a lot realizing that there's a lot of stuff, anger, repressed anger and stuff that I've not dealt with. And it feels like, like I said, crossing a threshold, the beginning of the rest of my life. It's the most meaningful work I could be doing because it's leading me every day to thoughts like this, what I'm about to share and just asking me to dig deep and ask myself like, what life do I want to live? Who do I want to be truly without the distractions without the noise? What do I want? And the greatest gift has been this pain because it's caused me to embark on this journey to really understand myself. And it's been the hardest thing I've ever dealt with the last six years of being in constant pain and it's been the most beautiful thing I could ever experience and it's been a gift like I've said this challenge has all led up to this so that's the backstory a, a little bit so about an hour and a half ago walking home from the gym and it's around six o'clock it's June all around the world <laughs> here in Japan there are hydrogenas I think that's how it's pronounced hydrangeas there's flowers that you know they could be found around the world but I actually discovered that they come from Japan and were exported or just brought to Europe from I think it was a, a Dutchman <laughs> off the cuff there so I'm not 100% sure about that but um, they're just absolutely beautiful these flowers that come in many different colors. They're kind of like just vibrant, but kind of like a matte color. Like they're not shiny. They're pink and purple and just like electric blue and there's deep blue. And it looks like there's just like supernovas within each flower of just blooming color. And, and it's amazing, those flowers. And I was walking home from the gym just feeling like I've accomplished a lot today because I'm overcoming this back pain. 
and a big part of it is facing fears because the fear um it's hard to explain without explaining this whole process i'm going through of the emotional cause for the pain this is thing called tms which is pretty much mind body syndrome which is the brain creating pain in the body to distract us from emotional pain and so even when there's pain in my body, it's it's harmless. It's harmless, but my body's just been conditioned for six years to feel this way, um, to distract me from the deeper stuff that I've not dealt with. From childhood, stressors of everyday life, just conflictions of the ego and the kind of narcissistic, unconscious being that lives within all of us that we aren't aware of. There's a lot going on. And I don't necessarily need to solve anything, but just understanding what's happening is healing and it actually like it heals your chronic pain and it's happening, but it's not a perfect linear process as anything that is real never is true healing, true growth, true understanding. You could, you know, buy a three week to the perfect abs app cassette that's that's not real the stuff that's real takes time there's ups and downs and that's the lasting change that i'm looking for that's a bit of an aside but so today well it's yesterday ran at the gym very hard for the first time in about a year been running for the last three weeks but yesterday I'm like, I'm, I want to do some sprints, get back to sprinting. I'm like, you know, we're told if you're a bad back, don't even run, but like, don't, don't sprint. That's crazy. I'm like, fuck that. I just feel like it and I'm doing it, facing the fear. And it felt great. You know, the workout pushed it hard, just running hard on the tre treadmill and back to my old ways. I just love to run. I love working out. Um, it's part of me that felt like it's been missing for six years, this physical release that's so important. Because even when you're feeling, facing stuff emotionally and stressors of life, working out is just a great way to release that, that strain and that pressure. And to not have that has been one of the most difficult aspects of this pain, that release. So I'm running hard. Had a great workout, felt fine. Today I was definitely very sore. And it's like I I didn't have like a flare up or anything. Like I would have had, you know, maybe a year ago when I still thought my pain was physical and then I decided to just run and then if I felt this pain today, I'd be like, I'd just go down a pain spiral of negativity and just fear and worry. But today I'm like, no, you know what this is. You ran hard you understand that the your brain is trying to protect you thinking that that this thing is dangerous that running th that um there's danger that's pretty much what's happening it's conditioned to make me fear this thing and i'm like no i'm just i'm not dealing with that anymore i'm not accepting it so today i just lived you know i had a normal day did my stuff kind of going through just the waves of the, the sensations in my body of feeling the tightness and soreness and some pain, but knowing what it is, I'm just like, whatever. Something that I realized yesterday, no matter if, even if I feel pain now, I'm out of pain because pain is the mindset the prison that I've been living in my mind for the last six years of constantly wondering if this is going to work out, if I'm going to be feeling this way forever, if I'm going to be injured, I'm just feeling like I'm broken and without any answers. I'm constantly looking for answers. And now I'm out of pain. Like for those six years, no matter if the pain would dissipate a bit, it would fluctuate. I'd still be in pain because I knew it wasn't gone. Now, 
even if I feel the sensations, I'm out of pain. I'm out of the mindset, the trap, the fear, which is more detrimental than the actual physical pain itself. So today I'm just like, is what it is. I'm still going to the gym, I'm still doing my thing. I'm not gonna let this pull me back because that's exactly what the brain is trying to do, make you believe that there's something wrong. It's all about reconditioning the brain, retraining the mind. And it's been a wild journey so far. So I got through the day and I did great. Very proud of myself. Did my workout, didn't push it, which is an accomplishment for me. I, I tend to overdo it. Walked out of there feeling like that's enough. Don't need to do any more. I was proud of myself for that. So I was walking home feeling good and passed these flowers, just a bushel of flowers. And I stopped, I looked at them, touched the petals, and it just blew me away. Just like, what is this? This is so beautiful. And then I'm walking and there's this crosswalk that I was in my neighborhood in Tokyo. And there's a, uh, kebab shop that I went to my first day here when I just moved here run by a Middle Eastern man with orange hair I met him on that first day and every day when I'm walking home I wave from across the crosswalk he waves back and it's just like it makes me feel part of the community and I was talking to my buddy Patrick last night about this that it's hard living in a foreign country. It is not easy knowing that no one really around you speaks the same language, that you are an outsider. People are looking at you. It's amazing in so many ways. And this is what I wanted. This was after there's this unique experience and it's been just beyond life changing, but it's not easy, especially leaving Osaka, where I had a bunch of friends, moving to Tokyo, to really having a couple of friends here and just kind of feeling like I've, well, I've just stepped into a new season that has its own challenges. And that guy, the kebab shop owner, put a smile on my face every night, just walking by there and just waving as I'm coming home from the gym. And I, past the flowers, I wave to the guy, sun's going down. And I just realized I'm like, wow, the last like five minutes, my life has been consumed by joy and awe and love. And I've completely forgotten about my back. Like that's, I've been only thinking about positive things, how grateful I am to be alive, then going through this spiritual odyssey that the flowers look so beautiful that the temperature was perfect. The guy just sitting out there in front of his kebab shop, smiling face, orange hair. And I'm like, wow, that is special. And if we could fill our lives with five minutes here, two to three times a day of just a state of awe and wonder like that, our lives will change drastically. That's the first part of the story. Then I went to the Cento, got home, changed, went to the Cento. And the Cento is a great place for a revelation. You're sitting there in the cold plunge. It's a meditation. Then you go to the sauna. And I was thinking about, I'm almost done with my second book, which is about a um, journey that I had two summers ago, exactly two years ago, beginning of June, April, May, June, where I worked volunteer at a hostel in Lisbon, Portugal, just working there, living there, cleaning there. It was hilarious. And then I spent three weeks on a farm in Calabria, Southern Italy. So it was my summer trip in Europe, and I'm very close to the end of writing this book about it. And I was thinking about 
it'd be cool to write the opener first, like, you know, the preface from Japan, just like from me here now, preface being in Tokyo, and then just, you know, a note signing it, Vinny, Tokyo 2024. And like, what? What would it be about? And what has been so cool about writing this book and brings me so much joy is just seeing the person that I was and how I've changed and just completely dipping into this period of my life in such detail. I've, you know, it's been, I think I'm on like the 14th draft, multiple editors. It's been so cool to see it, it morph and change and evolve. I know the whole book, like, you know, back of my hand. It's is deep in there. And just going back and dipping back into that part of my life that was so in, interesting and beautiful. And feeling the differences of who I was then and just how my life has changed since then. But also realizing that like I'm inspired by the book and the things that I'm saying. Oh boy. And I mean, that's us. That's, I take that as a good thing. Like, well, hopefully others will be inspired as well. But at the very least, this makes me happy. But just realizing that many of these things I still very much connect to and that they are themes, themes that make me who I am. And they're the same themes that brought me so much joy walking home from the gym of just the natural beauty of the world and connecting with people and being in a foreign environment and challenging myself and just doing something that feels like essential to being human, realizing how important that is to me. And as I'm in this very transformative period in my life, Japan for starters, but then the last month, the spiritual odyssey. I'm like, I'm thinking so deeply about what I want. I'm starting to think about what my life might look like after Japan, even though I really don't know what it's going to look like in two months. But I'm thinking like, what will I want to do? And I kind of talked about this before, but just realizing how important like depth of experience is to me. Maybe I'll travel like, you know, and just kind of bop around, but I'm here in Japan for probably what will be three years in total because it's like I've made my home here. It's forever changed me. It's deep. I'm learning about the culture and the same thing. It was only three months in Europe, but like, I love those. What about depth? That is what makes me really happy. And I'm just starting to understand myself in a much deeper way and realizing that the distractions, the things that we're supposed to do, the things that society says makes us successful or good, or important, they don't really matter to me. Like, once you know who you are, once you know what's important to you, even if everybody espouses the things that, you know, social media followers and likes and money and prestige, I mean, who really cares about that stuff? We're led to believe that that's what's important. But like deep within all of us, I think we're all wondering what truly matters. And I'm just starting to understand like I write. That's my thing. That's what I love because I'm obsessed with depth with moments and experiences. Like I just had this revelation in the center of like connecting the walk home with 
thinking about my book and writing like that part about being in Japan and reflecting on this European trip, connecting the dots of like, this is who I am. And I like got up and like left after another cold plunge. So I'm like, I gotta go just talk about this. It's all off the press. And realizing that it you know, like I said, once you start to understand who you are, the themes of who you are, the distractions, the stuff that we're led to believe are important just aren't important anymore. And so I think despite we got to have, you know, career, job, whatever, but like the themes, the essence of who we are is the most important thing because if you just keep on focusing on that, like get rid of distractions, just put up blinders and like, okay, what does this actually mean to me? Then you will begin to understand it will become clear the life that you want to live, at least more clear with every step that you take. And that's why, like, I don't know what's going to come next, but I'm not scared of it. I'm just excited for whatever comes up next because once you know who you are, you can move forth and just flow with whatever happens with just a feeling of confidence that things will work out as they're meant to because now you're solid. You are solid. And I can't see what's more important than building that foundation and really doing the research of going deep within ourselves and asking, like, what makes me happy? And looking for moments like that one I had walking home. And then I left the Cento and I walked outside. The sun was setting, just beautiful. Beyond the just like, you know, silver cityscape. A dad and a mom were talking with their two kids, the cutest little kids. Kids like high fived. They both rode away on their bikes. And I was like, this is beyond me. And it comes amidst a challenging time, too. I'm just, you know, this is challenging as well. So I'm trying to say it's that. It takes serious introspection and work and effort to understand who you are, you know, but there's no work that's more important. And I was reading letters to a young poet, Rainer Maria Rilke, Austrian poet in the early 1900s. I was looking for this one passage about living the questions. You know, we have these questions instead of needing the answers, living the questions. But I read his first letter and it just blew me away. So this guy in the early 1900s, he's a young poet and he reaches out to Rilke asking for guidance, advice. And Rilke responds. And what comes of it is the letters to a young poet. I've never fully read it. I've just read this one kind of passage that I was looking for. But then I came across this one. And I'm going to read it. You ask whether your verses are good. You ask me. You've asked others before. You send them to magazines, you compare them with other poems, and you are disturbed when certain editors reject your efforts. Now, since you have allowed me to advise you, I beg you to give up all that. You are looking outward. That, above all, you should not do now. Nobody can counsel and help you. Nobody. There's only one single way. Go into yourself. Search for the reason that bids you write. Find out whether it is spreading out its roots in the deepest places of your heart. Acknowledge to yourself whether you would have to die if it, if it were denied you to write. This above all else. Ask yourself in the stillest hour of your night, 
must I write? Delve into yourself for a deep answer. And if this should be affirmative, if you may meet this earnest question with a strong and simple, I must, then build your life according, according to that necessity. Your life, even into its most indifferent and slightest hour, must be a sign of this urge and a testimony to it. Then, draw near to nature. Then try, like some first human being, to say what you see and experience and love and lose. Do not write love poems. Avoid at first those forms that are too facile and commonplace. They are the most difficult, for it takes a great, fully matured power to give something of your own, what good and even excellent traditions come to mind in quantity. So you're saying, don't write love poems when there's always there's already so much out there that's kind of surface level already. That's not going to be really you. Therefore, save yourself from these general themes and seek those which your own everyday life offers you. Describe your sorrows and desires, passing thoughts, and the belief in some sort of beauty. Describe all these with loving, quiet, humble sincerity. and Use to express yourself the things in your environment, the images from your dreams and the objects of your memory. Good God, this is good. If your daily life seems poor, do not blame it. Blame yourself. Tell yourself that you are not poet enough to call forth its riches. For to the creator, there is no poverty and no poor in different place. And even if you were in some prison, the walls of which let none of the sounds of the world come to your senses, would you not then still have your childhood, that precious kingly possession, that treasure house of memories? Turn your attention thither. <laughs> Try to raise the submerged sensations of that ample past, your personality will grow more firm. Your solitude will widen and will become a dusky dwelling past which the noise of others goes by far away. And if out of this turning inward, out of this absorption into your own world verses come, then it will not occur to you to ask anyone whether they are good verses. My word. Nor will you buy be to interest magazines nor will you be to interest magazines in your poems, for you will see in them your fond natural possession, a fragment and a voice of your life. A work of art and good is good if it has sprung from necessity. In this nature of its origin lies the judgment of it. There is no other. Therefore, my dear sir, I know no advice for you save this, to go into yourself and test the deeps in which your life takes rise. At its source, you will find the answer to the question whether you must create. Accept it, just as it sounds, without inquiring into it. Perhaps it will turn out that you were called to be an artist. Then take that destiny upon yourself and bear it, its burden and its greatness, without ever asking that recompense might come from outside. For the creator must be a world for himself and find everything in himself and in nature to whom he has attached himself. But perhaps after this descent into yourself and into your own solitude, you will have to give up becoming a poet. It is enough, as I have said, to feel that one could live without writing. Then what? Then, then one must not attempt it at all. But even then, this inward searching, which I ask of you, will not have been in vain. Your life will in any case find its own way thence. And that they may be good, rich and wide, I wish you more than I could say. What more shall I say to you? Everything seems to me to have its just emphasis. And after all, I do only want to advise you to keep growing quietly and seriously throughout your whole development. You cannot disturb it more rudely than by looking outward and expecting from outside replies to questions that only your inmost feeling in your most hushed hour can perhaps answer. Perhaps you see how this relates to what I'm speaking about here. When something is important to you, it won't matter what everybody else is doing. And to realize what's important to you, you got to look for it. You got to be aware and open and plunge into the depths of yourself. And just cherish the journey because it is so worth embarking on. 
And once you know, I mean, Jesus, like he says, once you know, it won't matter what anybody else thinks. It won't matter what anybody else says because you're solid. Then you know, this is what I got to do. This is what I want to do. Whatever happens, happens. This is my path. And I am meant to walk it. Much love.